no in, uh, spiritual culture at all to speak of, and what Srila Prabhupada came to introduce it. But he was not confronted with the prejudices and the outright um, efforts against it. It was sort of neutral ground. It was demoniac. It was very low. But there were nobody that was, you know, like actively preaching against what he came to give. In fact, there was a group of people, the society was becoming somewhat open to this kind of message. Um, the back of the North chapter was facing a different uh, condition altogether. And so his life was a life of more or less striding across two great cultures. He was educated in Western thought. He was highly educated in Western philosophy, Western religions, English as a language. By the age of 18, he was already an accomplished English poet who had received awards for this gigantic poem called Poria that he had written about the life and activities of this Maharaj Puri, one of the first to confront uh, Alexander the Great in his invasion of India. And so he was a notable person. And he used his intelligence and his knowledge of Western culture to present Vedic conceptions and Vedic thought in a new way. In a way very much like Ashwin Prabhupada did, understanding the mentality of the audience and introducing it in such a way that they would be able to understand, appreciate, and approach this vast subject matter. But in order to do that, he had to overcome the prejudices of the time, which are still the prejudices of today, which makes this book, Notes on the Bible, so interesting. It's not very long. In this format, it's only like 26 pages. Um, I have it like this. I also have it in folio. Sometimes, some places you can find a hard copy. A little tiny book. Uh, really excellent, excellent, excellent book. And reading that, I thought, what an amazing way to try to understand and approach Srimad Bhagavatam. Because generally, when we study it, we study it in bits and pieces. We sit down in class, we hear a verse here, we hear a verse there, we hear a story there. But what is the Bhagavatam <coughs> all about? And, and what is the proper way to hear it and approach it? I mean, what is the grand overview? How do we understand it? And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he gives so much valuable instruction about how we can see it and reading it. I thought, wow, this is really amazing. This uh, way that he's explaining it, I never considered it before. And so I think new people and old people will all benefit by hearing these amazing, amazing words. Now, because we only have a few days, this is the third time I've tried to do this. In Vrindavan, uh, this last month of Parkra, for a few days, there was some time and we began to speak from it. But we didn't get very far, just a few pages. And then in Bangalore, I tried to do it twice. Once I tried to do it for the Sunday program, but frankly, the English of Bhakti Vrindavan Kora, a lot of it's very much like Siddhanta Sarasvati Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Prabhupada. Uh, it's quite odd. And he uses sophisticated language and also some of the concepts. And many people are just looking at me because our audience is mixed there. We have some educated people quite in depth in English, but we have another group that are not so good at it. So about half of them are just. And they and the local devotees are saying, hey, you know, we can't do this. So after two short sessions, I gave up. I said, but nevertheless, our own devotees, they can understand it. But in fact, all we have is Indian devotees there now. One Western devotee, Vitanaga from Bolivia. But he was the only one that I did. <laughs> this book is actually meant more for Westerners because it was a British audience and intellectual Indians were educated in Western thought. So, <coughs> just as Bhaktivedanta Thakur has written Jaiva Dharma and Chaitanya Shikshamrita, and it's been said that Jaiva Dharma was written more for you know, native speaking people, but Chaitanya Shikshamrita, which contains many of the same conceptions, was written in a way that was more broad-minded and appealing and understandable by Westerners. 
Right? Can you tell me that? Actually, Sri Dhar Maharaj said that. Ah. He said, Bhakti wrote these two different books, and the Jaya Dharma was for those of the East, ah. and the Sikshamrita for the West. Ah. Well, in both Chaitanya Sikshamrita and in this book, Bhakti Vinodha uses this really elegant Victorian kind of language which expresses the sentiments and thoughts of the day, this grand kind of inspirational language, and also this very precise philosophical kind of presentation, which just grabs him. At some point, he's going to offer prayers, Vaishnav, prayers in the Vaishnav mood, but completely in the culture and language of biblical and you can see how subtly and amazingly he's introducing really advanced Vaishnav conceptions, but in a very simple way, just like our Sri Prabhupada did. But if you are adept in the Vaishnav philosophy, you'll get much more out of this, and if you're not, it's still a very wonderful introduction. Okay, so, um, yeah. I just wanted to mention that you know, Bhakti Vinotakar's first English book written for the whole Western world, the Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Life and Precepts. Right. It's also like that. Yeah. The same kind of language, yeah. biblical kind of language. He even refers to Mahaprabhu as the Eastern Savior. The great Eastern Savior. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here also. <laughs> Uh, I was going to start out with this story that whenever they do a Bhagavad Saptaha, anyway, they always tell the story of Gokarna. But I think I'll save that. This is how we should hear and listen to Srimad Bhagavad But maybe I'll, I'll tell that a little later. So I have all these different things. At one point I thought this was going to be like a big fast, two hours a day for ten days kind of thing. So I got all these chunks and pieces because I didn't know how much to talk about and what we could do and how to realize it's way too much. But still, I have these really interesting things. If anybody wants to copy this, I have it in both hard copy, I have it in PDF, I have it in Word format, uh, so you can have it like that. And so, I have these different subject matters. One of them is the shlokas, from the first and second chapter of the Bhagavatam, which define the qualification of the speaker and the student of the Bhagavatam. The sages of Namasharanya are addressing their speaker, Sutta Goswami, and praising and citing his qualification, and therefore their eagerness to hear it, and he's reciprocating with them and saying, oh, your eagerness, your proper questions, etc. So there are a number of verses as well as her points by our Guru Srila Prabhupada with emphasis on certain <coughs> points. And for many of the audience here, well, actually for all of us, but especially for people that are new, it's very, very good for you to study these points and these per points. How many people here have read Srimad Bhagavatam? Uh, first chapter. First chapter. How many have not? And read the commentary. Not read. So everybody has some introduction, uh, mostly. Srila uh, Prabhupada's Srimad Bhagavatam, this is the first thing he wrote. And when he wrote it, just like Krishna Skara and Goswami, he did not know how long he would be on this planet. His intention was to complete the entire thing, but he didn't know if he would ever get that chance. And so, especially in his translation of the first canto, he packs everything in, into the introduction, into the first and second chapters, and actually, uh, in the first three verses, which really are like the Mangala Charana of the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, and everything is there. So, those first three verses I also have here. But because Shri Prabhupada's commentary is so prevalent, instead I took the commentary that Gurudev spoke from when he was in Badger in 1999 and they made a book out of this called The Secret Truths of the Bhagavatam. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur 
breaks down the first three verses and explains what they are and what the entire subject of the Bible talk is on five different levels, five different ways to perceive what Bible talk is about. Um, and Gurdjieff spoke about this, and it's very interesting because if you try to tackle this with not a lot of background, it would be somewhat difficult. It's very technical. These, these explanations. But then when you read Gurdjieff's lectures that he gave to a mixed Western audience in Badger in 1999, he does these same three things, but these three verses, but he does them in such a condensed and accessible way. <coughs> That's a genius. So if you ever want to read a most excellent book, you should read and understand the Bible time. Not just the introduction, but also the conclusion and what it's meant to come to you read Shula Gurdjieff's book, The Secret Truth of the Bible. Uh, it's not a good thing. It's a lovely, lovely book. And most of those uh, lectures were on video. It's available on video. And you see Gurdjieff and Badger speaking of those. And actually, I was there. I had been coming to see Gurdjieff for a couple of years. And I remember distinctly sitting in those lectures, being amazed and how profound and, and how important they were. And Gurdjieff, as he progresses, he progresses, he's talking about the necessity to cultivate an eagerness and agree to hear and learn these subjects by associating, just as he said today, with high class writing. And this message kept permeating his lectures for that entire week. Actually, it's like nine days at that time. He stayed like nine days. And near the end of it, it's funny, I have some of those videos myself. I don't have those here. I have them all. Rasa gave them to me. And Rasa, our, our godbrother, filmed these. And he had a, the delightful habit of panning the audience, scanning the audience. So you could see everybody there, and this was like almost 20 years ago. And so of course, Dr. Abraham and Yarba the fair, uh, others, you know, were there that we all know. And <laughs> and everybody looks younger, but this budding, bubbling enthusiasm and intensity of relationship with Shula Verde is just manifest in everybody's faces. And all the audience. It's just so delightful to see Agrude interacting with everybody and bonding and inspiring. And then I, I, I remember at one point he went back down to his house where he was staying. And <coughs> the crowd was fairly good, but somehow or other in the house, there was nobody there when he walked in the room. And he was in this kitchen area, hall area. You know, there's a little hall, a little like living room kind of thing, and right next to it is this kitchen that really just to live in and, and, and cook all day and night. Uh, <laughs> and he was just there. And I was there, maybe three, four other people were there. Pran, I think, was there. And I had a job, I had a job, suffering. And I was one of these guys who grew in this kind of inspire and you know, uplift and da da da. And being there for that whole week, I just, I, I, I just remember talking about greed, greed, greed. I said, oh, he looked at me. And he had this way about him, this very bemused look. He would sometimes look at you in this kind of humorous way. And then he'd go, lift his hand up and say, so, what are you thinking? What do you got to say? And it's just so friendly and loving. And I just said, oh, Grudev, I want that green. I want that green you're talking about. I was just so like a puppy, you know. And he, and he, and he walks up, and he's laughing, and he goes, oh, very good, very good. And he thumps me on the chest three times. Goes, very good, boom, boom, very good. And he laughs, and he walks back to his room. And I thought at that time, this is a benediction. This is like such a sun culture. What he says must come true. Uh, somehow, you know, my prospects have just taken another step up. 
And so it came to pass, a little more greed, not enough, but a little bit. Uh, you know. And so uh, that book actually was the inspiration for doing this class. You know, so, and those lectures as well. Um, <clears throat> so aside from the qualification of the speakers and the listeners, those verses in the first two chapters, by the time then, in the first chapter of the first canto, there are six questions that the sages present to Sutta Goswami. And these comprise the ultimate subject matter. They ask six questions. And then there are also, in the answer to those questions, there are ten subjects that are delivered. And there are two verses which describe those subjects, and Srila Prabhupada gives a brief explanation of each of them. And then, in addition to that, there are four essential verses of the Bhagavad Gita that, uh, I think you mentioned it today, four essential verses of the Bhagavad Gita that was the original Bhagavatam. When the Bhagavatam was first spoken, it was spoken in a condensed way into the heart of Lord Brahma, and he spoke these four verses, and it was these four verses that Narad gave to Vyas, which in his internal meditation under the order of Vyas, he later expanded into the entire Bhagavatam. So, 10 essential. So, oh, and also, I added to that four essential verses from Bhagavad Gita. There's two Chatu Shlokas. Two groups of four shlokas, one from Bhagavatam, one from Bhagavad Gita. Um, and then there's another section that I knew we probably wouldn't get a chance to do, but I'm making notes for part two of the Bhagavatam, which we do another time, which is the conversation between Vyas and Narad Muni, which gives a more detailed and elaborate glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam, why it was spoken and what the result will be for the people of Kali Yuga who hear it. This is in the fourth and fifth chapter. And in the sixth chapter, Narad tells his own story about how he, by association with great personalities and hearing them talk the Bhagavatam, ended up where he is now, which is the eternal associate, the traveling transcendental spaceman, as the true would call him traveling from universe to universe, even to Vaikuntha, to Goloka Vrindavan, going everywhere, preaching the glories of the Lord. So, uh, you're welcome to take these, or if after all this you send me an email, I can send it to you in a PDF on your email, I hope you want, if any of this you want. Uh, this looks on the bottom, it's a very small file, very small file. Or you can go around the corner and get a copy. So, um, let's start. I don't know how smooth this is going to go. Uh, I do my best. I do my best. Uh, okay, we don't want to do it. I guess we'll do it. Does anybody know the story of Gokarna? Anyone's heard this? Still. I didn't really know it that much because you know sometimes Bhagavad sometimes I don't speak Hindi and uh, uh, maybe tomorrow. So here is Bhagavad Gita course introduction. It's in the Shrimad Bhagavad Mahatmya, the story of Gopala. I had it on the seventh. The one I got is from a file on Gorgovinda Maharaj's site, and he's telling the story. He uses some of the verses, and then he tells the story, and then there's his commentary and lecture there as well. So that's another place to look at. It's pretty nice. So let's start. Let's make this a little bit bigger. It's kind of tough being a computer illiterate in the modern era. Okay, now listen to how we start. Now remember, 
He's addressing a largely atheistic, materialistic, Western educated Christian, but Christian with tremendous prejudice against anything Indian. They thought Indians were weird, strange pagans. Uh, they had no conception of Indian culture at all. And even the scholars that were there had a mandate to use their abilities to reinterpret it in such a way that they can undermine not only the value, but the intent and the history and everything that it actually didn't even come from India. It comes from some other place. And it's not an ancient work 5,000 years ago. It was something presented in very recent times. In fact, there's another book that Bhakti Thakur writes called Sri Krishna Samhita, where he speaks to higher conceptions of the God. Like he's speaking actually about God Mark, spontaneous attachment to the Lord. But in order to induce this educated audience to read the book, he says there are two versions of the history of the Bhagavad. One is the ancient version of the Vedas, one is the version of the modern scholars. So he gives the version of the modern scholars and the whole chronology of the entire Vedic era with four yugas condensed into about 2,000 years. Yeah. As the Manus were ordinary kings, and all these people were, you know, da 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 da. And it was spoken within just, you know, maybe a thousand years ago. And he says, I don't care, they can believe that, whatever they want. I just want them to hear the message. So he was very broad like that. He didn't care about certain details. And there's something in this presentation also where he dismisses some part of the Bhagavatam that is somewhat controversial or difficult for people to swallow, namely fifth canto descriptions of hell. And he says, oh, don't worry about it. It's just something made to scare the common people. Some kings wrote it, and they just included it to, because the Bhagavatam is a condensation of all the poetry. But don't worry about it. It's just not so important. There may be something there, he says, but it's, yeah, don't worry. So, here he begins. Now remember, he's sitting there with all these guys in their stuffy suits, you know, their three-piece British suits and their mustaches, and I guess they don't have their hats on, except their little watches, and they're all sitting in the chairs, and then there's Indians who want to do the same way in their suits, and they're all sitting there, and here's Dr. Benoit, 35 years old standing in front of this group. We love to read a book which we have never read before. We are anxious to gather whatever information is contained in it and with such acquirement, curiosity stops. This mode of study prevails amongst a great number of readers who are great men in their own estimation as well as in the estimation of those who are of their same stamp. You're not like that, are you? Oh, of course not. Uh, not us. You know, we just don't read it and stop. He says, in fact, most readers are mere repositories of facts and statements made by other people. But this is not study. The student is to read the facts with a view to create, and not with the object of fruitless retention. So actually what he's doing, he is foreseeing what modern education has come to, which is simply fruitless retention and spouting back of facts. Preordained <coughs> conclusions which you're not allowed to question, and just being able to recite them nicely, you're considered a scholar. Academic. Academic. Yeah, an academic, you know, and you get letters after your name. You know, and then people say, oh, yes, yes, yes. But he says, now this is for us. <coughs> really us, the receptive reader, if you want to study the Bhagavatam, this student, you read the facts with a view to create, not with the object of fruitless retention. In other words, your study of the Bhagavatam is not met or fulfilled if you can quote a lot of shlokas or tell a lot of stories. There must be some understanding and growing realization. 
This is his car. She the problem used to always tell us that. In fact, I remember 1971-72, we got this order that we should all write a little something every day. And he said that because by writing, maintaining some journal of thoughts, then your realization must come. And he said preaching was like that also. That when you study, when you hear, and then you speak, you are able to take that which you've understood and express it to others. It makes you think and consider the subject matter in ways other than just fruitless retention. So, students, us, were like satellites. And they should reflect whatever light they receive from authors and not imprison the facts and thoughts. Thought is progressive. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, <laughs> when you come to Bakke, sometimes you get so caught up in rules and regulations and structure, you lose that capacity. Remember when I was a new devotee? We were like that in, in ISKCON a lot. We just, bravo inside, bravo inside, right? And I, I, you know, being a young guy, I had all these low-life jobs like janitor and cleaner and stuff. And so, first day we were, I, you know, in the early days, I was in the Prashadam room downstairs in Brooklyn Temple. And one god sister was cleaning. Gory. Remember Gory? Yeah. What an amazing devotee. Anyway, she's cleaning with this dirty old mop and just plain water and no soap. Just smearing everything around. And I, I said, this is not clean. They ain't clean. You know, I know how to clean. You know, I, she says, in the Vedic age, water is completely purified. You know, Prabhupada said, I said, oh, Prabhupada said, okay, that shuts me up. You know, and, uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's not how it works. <laughs> Another time we're traveling, Sankar they didn't want to stop. You know, this guy is the leader, you know, he didn't want to stop. He's going to get to the next spot. So we're driving early in the morning, just waking up, and, and we got to go. No time for bathing. What do you mean? we got to bathe every day. Just pick your body out the window as we drive. Because Krishna said, a purifier's eye on the wind. <laughs> we'll be pure that way. So this is imprisoning the facts, you know, not reflecting them properly. <laughs> the author's thought must have progress in the reader in the shape of correction or development. He is the best critic who can show the further development of an old thought. But a mere denouncer is the enemy of progress and consequently of nature. So what he's doing now, he's holding up the Western tradition of philosophical and scientific evolution for critique. Because if you look at the history of the development of philosophy, starting from a time about Plato and Aristotle, Aristotle being the disciple of Plato, he's one of the first ones to reject the thoughts and conceptions of the previous teachers and come up with something new. And this is considered very glorious. Rather than acknowledging and standing on the shoulders of giants and acknowledging it since then has become something where you have to come up with some new slant. Something to do and, and to reject. And he's also therefore saying that now let's take a look at something very old and and worthy, the Bhagavatam. Just don't reject it because it's old. There may be some great gems there. He's not hammering with them, he's just opening up the door a little bit. And so when you're talking to people, when you're speaking and sharing and doing outreach, these are ways. Well, these are the thoughts of great, great personalities, the scholars, the greatest thinkers, the most disciplined people of their era, who compose these thoughts, not about the outside world, but the internal world of consciousness, exploring the development and evolution of human and ultimately spiritual consciousness. A path and a subject matter which modern society does not pursue. We pursue the evolution and development of matter. But consciousness and spiritual thought is not the subject matter of modern society. So we are the bearers of this wisdom tradition. This wisdom tradition, this is a phrase coined by one of our godbrothers, Prabhupada, who was trying to use 
the teachings of ancient society, of our ancient societies, and learn to integrate them, a la Bhakti into the lives and give meaning to people in the modern era. So, he says the modern critic says, just begin anew. Throw out this old stuff. Tear down the old building. Uh, that time is gone. Uh, but he says, these are shallow expressions. Progress is the law of nature, and there must be corrections and developments with the progress of time. But progress really means going further and higher. So progress doesn't mean to reject the old. It means to build upon it. And this is our tradition. This is the tradition of our charge, actually. That <coughs> the first commentary that we accept on the Bhagavatam is that of Sridhar Swami, which I've not had the opportunity to read, but whenever it's quoted, it's quite phenomenal. But with this mentality, you might think, well, what do we need that old commentary for? Uh, we should only read the modern commentaries. Uh, but one time, somebody came to Mahaprabhu who had written a commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he said, oh, this commentary is so good, it surpasses that of Sridhar Swami. You know, in other words, we don't need that anymore. The Mahaprabhu says, anybody who doesn't accept Swami, I consider to be a prostitute. Swami means master, it also means husband. So a woman who neglects her husband is like a prostitute. So anybody, Mahaprabhu is saying, that studies and tries to comment on Mahaprabhu without acknowledging the foundation and the contribution of Sridhar Swami is like a prostitute. And so this scholar was correct. And this is how our line builds. So Srila Verde, he likes to speak primarily on Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur's coming. But Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he fully acknowledges Jiva Goswami, Sundarvas, and also Sanatana Goswami's commentary, teachings of Rupa Goswami, that which he based his on. And then from then, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasaka Prabhupada, and then our Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, all built on the foundations that they were given. And they never claimed to be presenting anything new. What they claim is that we're presenting it in a way that is understandable and appreciable by the modern people. Same line, same line, different line. Yeah. So probably used to say, <coughs> old wine, new bottles. Right? So that's what people try to do, like Coca-Cola or something, you know? They want you to, you've tasted it, you've had it a million times, you think you're sick of it, so they come out with a new bottle. Coke new, Coke fresh. And you think, oh, I gotta try that. Uh, anyway, this is not Coke, this is something a lot greater. Um, so, he says, if we follow this foolish critic, we go back to the former starting point, and then we begin from there. He says, make a new race. And then we get up to a certain point, and then now we have to start back again, and, and begin again, and begin again. No. He says, these are stupid critics, and they'll never allow us to go the whole road and see what is at the other terminus, the other end. Uh, so he says, the shallow critic and the fruitless reader are the two great enemies of progress. We must shun them. So these are like the the shallow critic anarta and the fruitless reader anarta, you know, that we have to overcome because these are products of modern education. And so we adjust our approach to study and learning under the guidance of Dr. Vinoda and in a very polite way, in a very reasonable way, he's talking to these people and saying, now listen to this and try to hear what I'm saying. And of course, oh yes, this is one way, one way, go on, sir. So he goes on. Um, so it's not that there's no room for reading and criticism. There's a true critic and a useful reader. So he says the true critic advises us to preserve that which we already have obtained and adjust our race from that point where we have arrived in the heat of our progress. He will never advise us to go back to the point whence we started, as he fully knows that in that case, there will be a fruitless loss of our valuable time and labor. 
He will direct the adjustment of the angle of the race at the point where we are. When I read that, I think of Shilagurde. Shilagurde came to the Western world, and his intention was to speak to the audience that had previously been cultivated and brought up by Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That you've come to a certain point, I'm not going to start from the beginning again, I'm not going to begin anew, I'm rather, I'm going to take you from this point and take you further. But foolish critics thought that he was presenting something new and encouraging people to start over and be in a different way. So no, we're in the same way. I'm just taking where you've come and helping to build from that point. And so he says the characteristic of the useful student will read an old author and will find out his exact position in the progress of thought. He will never propose to burn the book on the ground that it contains thoughts that are useless. Now, here's the thing. When Gurudev did come, he had a lot of immature new disciples as well. And many of them used to go around and say, Oh, Sri Prabhupada, they call him Swami Maharaj, as if they had that intimate relationship. with Swami Ji. Yeah, or Swami Ji, which they had no right to do. False imitation of the guru's position. He's only giving basement teachings. We reject that. I only want to hear about Ross Lila. I remember hearing one time somebody speaking in front of a vast audience. Oh, Mahaprabhu, Yuga Dharma. We don't care for Yuga Dharma. Well, this is useless. You only want to hear about Mahaprabhu's internal reasons for coming. This is the wrong way to understand Shri Gurudev and what he came to give. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur is warning against that. You have to begin from your proper platform and approach the teachings of the previous acharyas with significant appreciation and reverence. And as you go on, if you ever heard Shri Gurudev speaking, oftentimes he would take directly the purports of Srila Prabhupada, have them read, often done by Shamarani, who's here, and then he would illuminate those purports. And by his illumination, what Srila Prabhupada wrote would appear to us in a way that we had never considered before. It was like we were reading it for the first time, same words, but illuminated, because he had full respect and honor for everything that Shula Prabhupada had written. And by following that mood of the useful student, we were able to think that, oh, my Guru has come to give so 